2016, I suffered from a condition called prostatitis. Uh, the onset of symptoms for this condition were gradual for me. It started with some pelvic pains, um, lower back pains, uh, groin pains. The urologist uh, diagnosed me with prostatitis and said that it's uh, something which can be caused by a bacterial infection. So he gave me a single dose antibiotic and a 10 day course of antibiotics. The 10 days went by, my symptoms got worse through those 10 days. They, I did not see any improvement. So he put me on a 4 week course of antibiotics and he was fairly confident that it should clear it up. Um, that four week course uh, saw my symptoms continue to get worse. The symptoms had become had worsened to a point where they were beginning to impact my life. I could not put in a full day's work. I had to cut back a lot of my social life because I was just not feeling up for it. Antibiotics that I was taking were also giving me side effects. So my digestive system was uh, giving me a lot of trouble and I was beginning to get some joint pains and tendon pains. When Pranav initially fell sick, we all were quite confident that doctors are going to be able to treat it the way that you normally treat a bacterial infection. I mean, we didn't think twice about what was happening to him. But as weeks turned into months and his suffering didn't end, we really became uh, we were really worried about why he was not recovering and the fact that it doesn't just take a physical toll on your health, it takes a mental toll on not just the person who is suffering, of course on him, but also on the people who are around him, his family, the people who love him. Because you're watching someone suffer and it's there's nothing you see, there's, there's nothing that you can do about it. Uh, when I went back to my doctor and he looked at my symptoms and did a physical examination of the prostate and he said that well I'm surprised that all of these antibiotics have not made any difference and he said we've pretty much run out of options in terms of the antibiotics that we have to treat you for this condition. So I started researching into alternate ways to treat bacterial infections and that is when during my research when I came across this when we found phage therapy, he found phage therapy. He was the one who was so driven to find an alternative that would work for him. Uh, that he was the one who spent a lot of time trying to understand phage therapy in detail. Um, my research into phages continued for another six weeks. And the more I researched, the more confident I became about this treatment. And finally, I opened dialogue with the Aliyawa Institute. In Georgia in uh, November 2016, I travelled to Georgia to the Aliyah Institute for my treatment. We decided it makes sense to go ahead with it because we would be reached a point where we were willing to try alternatives that even though we hadn't heard of them in India, it, we had to do something to get him back. Uh, in November 2016, when we finally went in for phage therapy, it was I think the fourth day after his treatment started that he finally came out of the, the symptom that would sap his energy the most which was a low grade persistent fever and I mean he wanted to celebrate that oh I don't have a fever today and uh, we were like no you know let's just wait don't, don't jump the gun yet wait and see if, it's, if it stays like that um, fortunately it did he didn't get the fever again he, started getting better, um, gradually but surely he was getting better. So then my last course of treatment finished in February 2018 and by the time my last course of treatment finished my symptoms were all gone and it was very liberating because I could start living life again the way I used to live. Um, so in the summer of 2018 I could travel with my wife and did another trip with the extended family so I could travel, I could drive, I could take road trips which I love doing.
Antimicrobial resistance is one of the most formidable threats to global health and security today. The United Nations Interagency Coordination Group on Antimicrobial Resistance estimates that by the year 2030, 24 million people worldwide could be driven into extreme poverty as a result of AMR and its effects on health and development. Antimicrobial resistance occurs when microorganisms develop resistance to antimicrobials they are exposed to, rendering many existing standard treatments ineffective. This problem has generated enormous international attention since its discovery, at once transcending sectors, society, and national borders. Consequently, the obstacles to tackling this issue are complex and multidimensional. Research into antibiotics and antimicrobials is actually very, very difficult. I usually, I usually say that, just imagine the, the challenge that we, 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 we like to give you some kind of a pharmaceutical that actually kills the living species, bacteria, inside of you, without harming you, you without killing you. So that's a, a, in itself a, 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 a tough challenge. There's tough challenges also to, to actually uh, develop the, the proper protocols for clinical trials. How would you actually set up the trial with, with people being ill, could you, it, would it be okay to give one of, of part of, of, of that population an antibiotic and another part some kind of a placebo, knowing that the infection will kill this, of course that is not okay. So, so actually even making the protocols for clinical trials for this kind of development is kind of tricky. And a lot of the, the antibiotics that come down are really the ones that we would use as, as last resort, last step type of, of antibiotics when people are really, really, really sick and need them very promptly. So it's, that's the challenge in itself. There is most likely a very huge overuse of antibiotics. They're cheap. The old ones are very, very cheap. So in, in, in developed countries, there is a definitely a, a big risk for reuse. Although we know that parts of the world in, in developing countries, there is still a, 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 a limited access to even the most cheap antibiotics. But in general, we would say that, that due to that antibiotics are powerful, very cheap, there is always a big risk that you would see a potential overuse. Instead of, of using like proper diagnostic kits to, to really, really uh, have the right diagnosis on what is the pathogen that actually gives this infection to this patient, that diagnostic kit in itself might actually be more expensive than a broad spectrum antibiotic just to give it like that and treat it. So, so there is a lack of of real, real good incentives, to be honest, both in the industry and healthcare. But also, I would say there is a tremendous challenge on the, let's call that, on the more global scale, on the political scale, that, that different countries do not really trust one another either to be able to have a responsible use of, of the, let's say, new antibiotic coming in. Uh, we know that some countries already, oh, still today, I would say, antibiotics are prescription free. And then I understand that countries that have invested a lot in, 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 uh, in responsible use are mad on those countries that do not have good stewardship programs in place. And so they say a, a fight uh, on the global scale between, between countries is very tough for institutions like UN and others to, to go in there and, and manage this. So that's a, a challenge in itself. And probably the, the same challenge as everyone was is aware of when it comes to global warming, which is also a huge threat to public health, is there with, with, with AMR. We, we need to come together as, as one joint big family on this planet. And you could all imagine every time we have to really 
come together on a global scale, we, we uh, face pretty big challenges. So it's a very, very tough quest we have in front of us to solve the cases that we have. Although there are many obstacles, there is a spectrum of potential solutions against the rising antimicrobial resistance. To me, the most important thing we have is the responsible use of the, of the antimicrobials or the antibiotics and the other uh, treatments that we have. And and the responsible use actually means the very, very restricted use, both in animals and in humans. And responsible use actually, to, to be able to, to get there, we need working systems on surveillance and monitoring to understand the, the resistance patterns different markets, what could actually be used and what will not be able to use to treat the specific infection. And I would say that surveillance systems need to be developed across the globe. There are good examples in a number of, of countries, but a lot of, of this knowledge that comes from, from good surveillance programs is actually not there. And actually the, the best way to, to decrease the, the, the use or to limit the use of antibiotics and, anti and other antimicrobials of course is if we could, could decrease the infection pressure in society so people do not get ill. So, so whatever we could do to prevent infections is extremely valuable and uh, one of the strongest tools that we have, of course, is vaccines. Uh, but in general, I would say that hygiene and sanitation is extremely valuable too. So, so uh, simple stuff, simple as clean water, extremely important and then good hygiene and sanitation. There's a lot of work we need to do here to, as I say, decrease the infectious pressure in, in society that would help us to, to limit the need for antibiotics. But in those cases where antibiotics or other antimicrobials are really needed, it's of course extremely important to understand what is the pathogen that we need to treat. And then we need diagnostics diagnostics to actually be able to, to, to set the right diagnosis. That would allow us to use narrow spectrum antibiotics instead of the broad spectrum antibiotics. The narrow ones just attacking that specific bacteria, that pathogen that caused the illness. If we use broad spectrum antibiotics, we actually kill pretty much everything, which is both a problem for the patient being treated but of course that also really, really drives resistance. So diagnostics is, is extremely important. And I want that diagnose that those diagnostic kits to be very rapid in order for us to not have to wait for hours and hours before we could initiate the treatment. And then of course, regardless if we are very successful in, in in decreasing the speed of resistance development, there will always be a need for new antibiotics, new antimicrobials. So, new classes of antimicrobials. And the big, big challenge here is that, uh, that the pharmaceutical industry is, of course, a, a commercial actor. It costs us a lot of money to develop new antimicrobials. And if there is not a market, because we all like that new antibiotic to be used extremely, extremely limited. So, so there is not really a market that would give back the money to, 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 uh, to industry. We need to have completely new business models developed. Business models that 
the link, the, the, uh, the strong bond that we have today for all pharmaceuticals between the volume sale, the sales volumes that we have and the money that we get. We need to delink that. And these are the kind of, of, uh, of actions that are being undertaken by all the different actors I see in this, in this ecosystem today, regardless whether we talk on the global level, but with UN type of action plans or country specific action plans, the way we discuss in, in industry and, and, and companies, all of these aspects are there. But in addition to this, which is extremely interesting to see, are a bunch of novel techniques. Techniques. Uh, monoclonal antibodies are, are one of those new ways of, of uh, trying to treat the infections, monoclonal antibodies. We have uh, treatment paradigms based on versus uh, transplants that could especially be extremely important after a, a, a treatment with, with especially broad spectra type of antibiotics. And then also, which is uh, not really a very, very new idea, a new uh, possible treatment paradigm, but not very well developed. Bacteria phase. And, and those phase are viruses that actually kill the, the bacteria. So working in similarity with antibiotics actually, uh, these ones are uh, by definition always very narrow spectra. They are very specific on, on a certain uh, uh, pathogen, uh, certain bacteria. So, so uh, as I talked about diagnostic being very important for the, for the use of antibiotics to secure that we could use narrow uh, spectra antibiotic. The same thing holds true for bacteria effects to be really successful that we have good diagnosis so we know what are the pathogens that we are going to attack. So here is an area where I believe a lot of new research will be conducted over the years to come and uh, that put some good hope into that this will help us to define the game's antimicrobial resistance. Bacteriophages are viruses that only attack bacteria and not our own cells. They have two distinct life cycles one of which is the lytic cycle. Lytic cycle occurs when the bacteriophage attacks the harmful bacteria by injecting its DNA. Inside the bacteria, new phages are assembled using the host cell's machinery. The overloaded phages proceed to cause the burst, or lysis, of the bacteria. Newly formed phages are then released, and the cycle repeats. However, the translation of theory into reality will always be met with practical challenges. Uh, so the main challenges uh, with phage therapy is uh, primarily uh, from uh, the regulatory point of view that um, you need to give them as um, uh, combination therapy and that means you have to approve a lot of individual phages and also whether they can be used in a cocktail. And this is not really uh, similar to any other product that's being approved by regulatory authorities. So I think for that reason, a, a new mechanism needs to be developed for phages. And if you take uh, regulations, they phages m might be considered as a medicinal product. So it's, so it's sort of not uh, treated as, as uh, a medicine. I mean, the, the legislation is quite rigid. So you can't, some, some advocate that, that you can use phages as a medicinal product, and some 
say that okay if it's going if it's going to be used on a broader scale then we need to, to change the regulation a bit because they've um, it's live material it, I mean they change uh, they mutate uh, they recombine so you, you can't be sure that that you have a well-defined substance when you when you treat the patient because it might have changed since the last time so it's it's quite tricky with with, with phages to, to make them or, or to classify them properly and, and to to sort of squeeze them into the, the contemporary uh, regulations that we have. One of the challenges with phage therapy is that many people consider that it's not really novel. So they consider that it's something which is, has been around for a long time and they fail to acknowledge that although it has been used, it has not been used or approached in the way that we need to approach it uh, in order for this to become a regular antimicrobial. So I think that actually hampers things, that uh, it's not fully understood that although there is uh, experience, clinical experience, this is not sufficient. So there needs to be more uh, preclinical studies, there needs to be animal models, there needs to be a lot of things. And this has been sometimes difficult to get the message through that yes, okay, this is not entirely new, but using them systematically, in fact, is new. It's also lack of, of, uh, of basic research and people are trying to do shortcuts. They are trying to jump directly into phage therapy. And, but I think we need to understand more about how to use them properly instead of just uh, saying, well, let's, let's start using them, uh, uh, which some people do, because I think if we do that, we will not really learn uh, from the mistakes and, and we should approach this uh, problem in the same way as we would do with another antimicrobial, which we would never allow on the market as a trial or an error concept. And I think we clearly have to stop pretending that this is uh, just old news because uh, the, this new way of using them, dosing them properly, is definitely not old news. This is a, a, a completely new approach, but using an old concept. Uh, and the technical issues is that, or there are many technical issues, one is that we need to get them pure enough to be able to, to comply with, with the regulations. I mean, you can't grow phages and you, you grow phages on bacteria so you need to get rid of all the debris that that is the result of, of a phage infection and that is a problem because it's 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 not like synthesizing an antibiotic it, it's like we, we take the sludge from 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 a phage infection and then we just sort of sieve out the phages from that and do so without getting all the endotoxins and, and exotoxins that, that follows with it. So we need to, to have methods that, that purify phages to, 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 to clinical standard. And we're not, we can do that today, but, but then we also lose quite a lot of phages. So the title of the, the, the phage, uh, sort of the phage that we treat with, the title becomes too low. So there, that's one of the technical issues. The other one is that we, we're not, I mean, since, since they are consist of proteins, you can't swallow phages uh, and expect them to reach your intestines because they, they, I mean, they're proteins, they get broken down. So it's, it's like food. I mean, we break down proteins every day. So that's also one of the technical issues that, that we have. And uh, from the pharmaceutical company point of view, it's also quite a number of challenges because uh, phages are not like, first of all, you use them in combination therapy. You use maybe five or six phages. And uh, even uh, in the individual case, uh, the, the, the composition you give of phages will depend on which strain you are trying to combat. So it's more or less like a customized uh, treatment. And if you were to approve each and every phage as an individual antimicrobial, this would be extremely costly. And, and also, uh, so I think the problem is that the, the current legislation 
uh, is is so that it, it's not really adapted uh, or, or the the whatever applies to regular antimicrobials is not well suited for for phage therapy so one rather needs to find maybe a mechanism by which you can approve uh, groups of phages as soon as they have uh, shown to be safe to administer to, to patients and then uh, it will have to be some uh, uh, may be uh, prepared by pharmacies uh, in the individual case because if you go for a fixed combination of phages you may see that it will in many situations not be uh, a good combo because it will only uh, you will end up maybe uh, in many cases just having one or two of the phages in your cocktail which is active against the strain you are trying to kill and that's not enough you need all of them to be active and that's why you need this flexibility that you actually customize the product. So it's, it's like personalized medicine, if you like, uh, trying to target specifically those bacteria. And that's where we need uh, some other um, kind of, of uh, um, approach to it. And I think there is also the problem that for uh, pharmaceutical industry, it's not clear how they could make money from this. Uh, so even that is something that needs uh, to be looked into. Some people are working on uh, synthetic phages, where you use phages as a delivery system of another antimicrobial. This might be easier uh, from a pharmaceutical point of view because it can actually then uh, lead to um, a situation where you can say uh, that this should be more or less regarded like, like a new drug. But the traditional phage therapy and uh, the phages you can isolate from the environment and from uh, from from fecal samples and so on so and and anyone with knowledge can do that so the question is then what is there in that for the pharma industry and of course there is the purification and and also um, uh, preparation of this in in uh, uh, proper as proper medicinal products that, that live up to the standards we expect in terms of safety. But how you could do that and still make money for it when you need to do, in fact, many individual phage solutions that you can combine as uh, you require, that's, that's a bit of the challenge because they need to keep up so many different products and, and so many lines of, of phages to be successful. So if one company just has uh, 10 different phages, that will not be enough. We have seen phage therapy work in, in, in many cases, but we've also seen uh, clinical trials that uh, haven't shown any, any efficacy. Uh, they've been around, say, 25-40% of, of the uh, patients uh, have been cured, uh, which is quite a low number. Um, so the, the problem with, with clinical phage therapy is that, that you need to, to take these uh, sort of the, what it's called is, is pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. You need to take those into account because they have very special pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics and you need to sort of know a little bit about what's going on uh, when you administer phages to, to patients. And I think that the clinical trials that we've seen hasn't used uh, enough phages. I mean, they've had too low titers of phage to be able to cure the, the infections. That's one thing. Uh, but they've also not uh, been aware probably of the importance of the ad adsorption rate of the phage. I mean, if you have a, a nasty phage, a very sort of virulent phage, or if you have a, a phage that's only sort of mildly infecting the bacteria, that, that makes a very big difference between different phages. Another problem is uh, how to do um, rapid uh, testing of phage susceptibility in acute infections. Because uh, if you use it just empirically without knowing, you might end up uh, with selecting for phage resistance because maybe just a few of the phages in your cocktail is actually susceptible. Nevertheless, the future awaits.
phage therapy still has a role to play in tomorrow's healthcare. I think the potential for me as a phage scientist, it's been, and I think that there's a consensus that this does work. So that's, that's not the issue. But I think the potential is actually realizing it's becoming reality for one very unfortunate reason, that now we actually need it more than ever. The, the in rapid and extensive uh, increase in the multi-drug resistant bacteria and in, in the infections and the mortality um, connected to it, that has made people more open-minded. Fortunate and unfortunate both, but I think that 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 is one of the reasons why the potential that has always been there can actually become reality. There was a 10 years time when there was a lot of talk, but nothing happening, but it, it takes more than the willpower of the researchers. So, so I think that that, that is the main, main thing that's happening now, that the people who are sitting on the money and who have the power of deciding and, and allowing new, new ways of doing things to, to come, that I think that that, that is very important. Um, about Tage's potential, I think that one very interesting, um, uh, interesting branch of it is also to start using modified phages, because um, as the technologies have been quite rapidly um, improving, in the recent years that enables and allows a lot more sophisticated um, uh, means of improving the phages so that we can quite simply improve the characteristics um, of the phage products. So that is also something uh, that we will, we will see in the future. But I think it's, it's modern healthcare, as I've said before, it's, it's uh, once the, the antimicrobial resistance among the bacteria goes up. So say that, that more and more bacteria get resistant and, and we don't know how to cure them. Then phage therapy might be an alternative and we have to focus on how can we get it more effective. But the regulation is quite strict and phage therapy today is, is not 100% Effective. So what we need to do is to get the uh, effectiveness, but we, we need to improve the efficacy of phase therapy. Uh, and we also need to, to, to uh, do that by more research into the pharmacology, into the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics when you use phages. I, I think one of the key motivations to doing this research is to actually see the activity of, of the phages uh, in, uh, in the lab, uh, which is quite astonishing, and also to see the specificity of it, which is also... Uh, so, to me, it's a matter of a number of solving a, a number of difficult uh, practical problems, but it would be definitely worthwhile doing that, because I think we need these um, uh, as, as uh, uh, drugs, and I think it's the challenges that exist are possible to solve, but we need maybe to think in another way than we have done in the past. I think personally, one of the very exciting things with the phages is that you can, uh, and where I think they are most well suited, is actually for preventing infections. Because if, if people carry bacteria that you know are prone to cause infections, then you can actually decolonize those individuals and you can reduce their, uh, their likelihood of having uh, infections. Possibly you can also combine phages with tra traditional antimicrobials. Uh, I think one of the key problems is if you have very acute infections, you might not be able to use phages because they usually need to be tested in advance and then you need a very rapid test system to see if the, the, the phage cocktail you have taken out is actually appropriate. But I think it's um, the, 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 well, the, the power of these uh, 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 natural products is, is really uh, quite astonishing, I think. And um, uh, regardless of, of the challenges ahead, uh, one still has to 
just uh, as a researcher appreciate that this uh, could definitely be a very good uh, tool for us. Uh, of course it could be misused as anything else and we should not underestimate the challenges but we should also not give up very easily because uh, uh, there are maybe not that many great alternatives. We do have some other antimicrobials entering the market but usually there is also resistance developing to, to these uh, uh, new uh, compounds and they are really not uh, uh, extremely innovative in, in the targets they have so they are more or less uh, drugs working in a similar way as other antimicrobials which bacteria already have developed resistance to. So in that sense uh, it's, uh, it's concerning to see if, if this is, uh, uh, will, due to the difficulties, be left aside and uh, not picked up on. But I'm, I'm sensing that uh, uh, there are many people now who are really interested in phages. And I think you're, you have to see for yourself uh, uh, how powerful they could be and also how, how low collateral damage they have on the microbiome, which is another important uh, aspect. And when you see this, I think you can just not uh, stop being excited about their uh, potential. The mission of iGEM Stockholm 2019 is to create a switch that can control the two life cycles of the phage, thereby improving the reliability and efficiency of phage therapy. Named after the great female scientist, Esther Lederberg, we present to you, Esther.